somewhat like the angry youth, but rather longer in the tooth. We'd got be feisty, loud, uncouth. We're disaffected middle-aged women. Kicking our heels against the wall, plotting in the shopping mall, go tell them we're not playing ball. We're disaffected middle-aged women, armed with sertraline prescriptions, feminist magazine subscriptions, complaints of various descriptions. We're disaffected middle-aged women. We won't be judged on how we dress. We're going to save the NHS. We're doing yoga for the stress. It's dis we're disaffected middle-aged women with the leadership skills of Princess Leia and the kicks of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. We don't chill out, we had a layer. We're disaffected middle-aged women. We're meeting to plan our strategy by the gates at school at half past three, pumped up on hormone therapy. We're disaffected middle-aged women. So bosses and sexists, be afraid. We're not your skivvy or your maid. We don't care if our colours fade. We're disaffected middle-aged women, forming a gang on an estate near you. Fighting the cuts and misogyny too. Then home in time for a refreshing brew with the disaffected middle-aged women. Ah, good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, yeah, before I was, uh, so that's why I'm a, I'm a disaffected middle-aged woman. Go around stirring people up. Uh, before I was a disaffected middle-aged woman, I was, of course, a disaffected youth. And um, I still like to listen to the music I listened to in those days. And like a lot of poets, I like to rewrite the lyrics. And I particularly uh, like to rewrite the lyrics of songs that are told from a bloke's point of view. I like to rewrite them from uh, the woman's point of view. So judging by the conversation before we started this evening, and I'm thinking probably quite a few of you remember Up the Junction by Squeeze. Yeah, we're getting some nods and some thumbs. Excellent. Right. OK, so you remember the story of bloke gets together with his girl, they move into flat, she gets pregnant, um, he drinks too much, she leaves him. Uh, yeah, happy story. Um, anyway, so I rewrote it from the girl's point of view. Just as a little aside here, um, when I'd finished writing it, in a rush of blood to the head, I emailed it to Chris Difford, the original lyricist um, of uh, Up the Junction. And 10 minutes later, I didn't think he'd reply, but ten, he replied 10 minutes later saying he thought it was brilliant. So I said, can I record it, please? So it's been recorded by this feminist punk band called I Doris. And you can buy it on their band camp page uh, for a pound and all your pounds go to Women's Aid to support their work in helping women and children fleeing domestic violence. So there you go. This is called The Girl from Clapham. I never knew it was Gordon the guy who came from Morden. His face was cute and handsome. So that's when we began some adventure, most romantic, impassioned, snogging antics. He said I wasn't common. His chat up lines were rotten. We rented an apartment and sat there in the darkness. Our income for domestics could not afford electrics till he got a job on Mondays, flogging knockoff undies. And when we got the lecky, just sat there watching telly. I put up blinds and pictures. He wanted to get hitched, but our money we'd be needing for another mouth for feeding. He said that I had trapped him. He didn't know how it happened. I told him in his anger that it takes two to tanga. We squabbled through the winter. I felt and he drank bitter. He worked from dawn till evening while I did all the cleaning and cleared up all the crap that he left around the flat. And it seemed I was in, in prison as a girl in my condition. And when we had the baby, he said it helped me. Maybe he tried to make an effort, but pretty soon he left it, flogged the telly for a pony and pissed it up with Tony. Spent weekends like a loafer, passed out on the sofa. And now I'm two years older, I'm living with a soldier. I swapped a drunken loser for a fighter and abuser. He's always on his travels and so my life unravels. It's just me and my daughter alone in army quarters. Now I'm sat here in a barracks peeling spuds and carrots, making stew and dumplings, the radio for company. And now the stupid beggar sent another letter with his and my dysfunction. We're really up the junction. Thank you very much. That was so amazing. Long. I love that. I love your take on the song. Thank you very much. Cheers. Yeah, do 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 listen to and, and buy the iDoris actually recorded 
uh, version of it. Uh, it's great. Uh, it's, it's also on my YouTube channel somewhere, I think, yes. Uh, so you can look at that too. Um, so I, I have long been that a ranty, ranty, sweary, lefty poet, but a few years ago I thought I'd better learn a bit about proper poetry. Um, so um, I, read a, I read a biography of Philip Larkin. Turns out he's a bit of a right-wing prat, actually, but there you go. Um, anyway, there's there's a bit in it where he's talking about his time at Oxford oh, University in the 1940s, and it describes uh, one of the friends he made there as, amongst other things, an author of several unpublished books. And those of you who write poetry, which is probably all of you, you'll recognise that sometimes you, you, you read a phrase and it's got a certain rhythm to it that says to you, use me as a refrain line for a poem. Um, and then my head started to unpick the politics of that, right? And I thought, look, if you're an undergraduate bloke at Oxford University in the 1940s, and therefore very, very posh, um, and you're the author of several unpublished books, it's almost certainly because your books are crap. But for everybody in that position, there are thousands upon thousands of working class women and men who are also the authors of several unpublished books, um, not because their books are crap, but because they don't have access to that level of privilege and resources to get their book published. Or maybe life got in the way of them writing the book in the first place. Ditto, unexhibited painters, unrecorded musicians, et cetera, et cetera which is a long waffly way of introducing this poem that was inspired by that line in that biography of Philip Larkin, and it's called Unpublished Author. A traveller to worlds of unvisited places, a winner of numerous unstarted races, a painter of touch-ups that could have been pictures, designer of unproduced fittings and fixtures, inventor of gadgets that never made patent, find skills unfulfilled and fierce passions still latent, a cordon bleu chef feeds her kids what she cooks, an author of several unpublished books. <coughs> a soul-drenched soprano who sings in the shower, an artist who hires out her craft by the hour, a teller of stories, a co-educator, a thinker, philosopher, poet, creator, composer of lullabies heard just at home, her life may stand still but her mind likes to roam, a scrawler of lines stuffed in crannies and nooks, an author of several unpublished books. A washer of dishes, a wiper of arses, a lister of wishes, a dropout from classes. When muse could have struck, she was clearing up muck or her earning a buck or so tired she got stuck. A riser at dawn, she's a clock in and outer, she's patched up and worn, she's a serial self-doubter. The sleazeball at work, so she's losing her looks. An author of several unpublished books. She danced in the dusk but her neighbour's abusive. Containerized living is hardly conducive. She'd love to be noticed, but breaks are elusive. The one time she tried, the reply was conclusive. A writer of plot lines, divisor of hooks, an author of several unpublished books. A worker of overtime, Christmas is nearing, toiling in noise, getting harder of hearing, watch time grinding onwards, her dreams disappearing, her subconscious critic is constantly jeering. She's one of those stars whom our world overlooks an author of several unpublished books. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so it is time for a long and angry poem because some subjects deserve long and angry poems. And uh, this poem is about the Grenfell Tower fire. And it starts off with something of a Dickensian theme um, and it's called A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times and the worst of times and the north of the borough gets the worst because of accidents of birth and because that's just the way it works and yes you guess the south gets the best and the rest of the country only registered that Kensington had a proletariat when it shocked the commentariat by electing a Labour MP five nights before a fire on the fourth floor spread faster and further than it was supposed to do and grew from its room and consumed and entombed a tower full of humans. The rich and the powerful were on <coughs> oh, unscorched, untorched, untouched, unburned, unburdened by losing pretty much everything. Until then, most folks thought that Kensington hosted mostly royals and billionaires, not the toilers, but the heirs and your graces in palaces and similar places, and with more money than you could possibly know what to do with. And skeletons. 
They knew that Kensington had skeletons, skeletons in its museums, skeletons in its graveyards. And now the skeleton of what hundreds of people used to call home calls out the skeletons in the <coughs> cluttered cupboards of the town hall, stubborn behind a firewall, a smoke screen wiped clean by the dinosaurs of class rule, the boars and the fools who rush and stomp around, crushing lesser life forms into the ground. The rich and the powerful tightened our belts, but not their own and a tower full of people lost their life or their home. The rich don't live in tower blocks or social housing with stocks. When they reside in tall buildings, they're called opulent embellish, they are called, <coughs> sorry, luxury developments with opulent embellishments and panoramic views from the penthouse, not a cheap to rent house or a spot a worn and spent house, high, riders, high flyers in high rises at high prices, high status in high places. They don't live in flats, they live in apartments. They live apart in fire resistant compartments with state of the art smoke alarms. And so they should. They're entitled to a fire escape, a safe space, a comfortable place to live, but so is everyone. And you can be sure that in every apartment on every floor, there is a sprinkler system. And that if there is cladding, then it's gilded wrapping with all the trappings, not lined with aluminium, the bare minimum, second best, failed the test, discounted price, discounted advice, discounted concerns about how fast it burns, skin flint, say you're skint off the back of a lorry and onto the walls of the towers in the sky, where the common people come to live and die. The rich, and the powerful get their riches and their power from the labours of the powerful and their neighbours and people like them, like us. The first named dead had fled a war zone. He wanted to go home when the war was done. He was learning skills to help rebuild, but he was killed under enemy fire. People die like this when people live like this, squashed into boxes in tower blocks, put up on the cheap, putting up people, keeping the least possible cost per life lost per square metre or square feet of prime real estate, a drain on the rates. People die like this because people are made to live like this by a system that gives only to the few, not a civilised living to the likes of you. A system like this run by spivs for hire who wouldn't piss on you if you were on fire. The rich and the powerful keep their riches and their power. While a tower full of humanity, of friendship and of family, of talent and potential, of working class folk goes up in smoke. It's always the people in the cheap seats in steerage, the lower orders, the servants' quarters, the back stairs, the disrepairs, the slum colony, travelling through life and economy class, the wage slaves, not the masters, the underclasses. And what of those who run this system? The decision takers, the policy makers, the architects of TMOs and ELMOs, the scrapping, rent capping and right to buy and buy to let and let's get by on whatever we can get, a bed, a roof above our head, a home not fit for habitation, voted down the legislation, closed the fire station. Compassion fakers, quick to forsake us. In Kensington or Westminster, hold, <clears throat> hold the line, then resign. Anything to avoid responsibility, anything to pass the blame. Heads must roll, heads must hang in shame. The rich and the powerful give the victims the body swerve. They've got a nerve. While the powerful get donations from neighbours and from strangers that fill the community centre shelves, given by those a little less unfortunate than themselves. The rich and the powerful close the doors in the faces of you and yours to talk about the powerful and sanitize the cause of death and destitution on 24 floors. <sighs> we need a big swig of water after that one. Okay, so, what I'm going to say, oh, I'll do this one next. Let's have a bit of a history lesson next, okay? Who's heard of the Stonewall Riots? So, excellent, good, excellent, good stuff. So, in 1969, uh, New York police raided a gay bar called the Stonewall Inn on Christopher Street. Uh, we wouldn't remember it if that was all that happened because that used to happen all the time. And usually the clientele would just go home um, if they were lucky enough not to get arrested. Um, but on that night, it was different because the clientele fought back and they rioted for the next three nights. And in doing so, they superseded the previously existing um, kind of polite, apologetic homosexual tolerance lobby with a new, assertive, militant gay liberation movement. 
that evolved into today's LGBT plus movement. And pride in this country started marking the anniversary of the Stonewall riot. That is why it's always in late June. And um, yeah, the key fact here is that pride is rooted in a riot. Not that you would know that by going on pride these days. So I thought I would write this poem in order to remind people. It's called Stonewall Was a Riot. It wasn't the Stonewall focus group or the Stonewall business case. It wasn't the Stonewall let's present our most respectable face. Long years of asking nicely have not got us anywhere. Our rulers did not listen when we whispered, it's not fair. So when rewriters try to say we won by being quiet, remind them of our history, that Stonewall was a riot. It wasn't the Christopher Street parade or a carnival with floats. No candidates turned up and smiled to try to win our votes. It wasn't the Stonewall letter or the Stonewall resolution. It fought all night to light the dawn of the gay rights revolution. When glossies feed you tales that serve a bland and spiceless diet, remind them of our history, that Stonewall was a riot. Starbucks did not sponsor it, nor Barclays Bank, nor Nike. It was not led by lobbyists, but drag queens, fags and dykes. The advertisers did not book a rainbow centre spread and coppers did not dance with queers, but beat them till they bled. When corporations claim our cause, then comrades do not buy it. Remind them of our history, that Stonewall was a riot. Now every tactic, loud and quiet, is welcome on our stall. But if it hadn't been for the Stonewall riot, we'd have no pride at all. <sighs> Clive, how long have I got? As long as you like. As long Basically. as I like. Oh, <laughs> you might regret saying that. Oh, I won't. No. Uh, okay. Look, I'll do. I will do. I'll do two more. A long one and a short one. That all right? That will do. Okay. Let's do another long poem then. Long poem about mental health. Mental health gets talked about a lot more now than it used to, which is good. Um, fortunately, what's not so good is a lot of what's said about it is a bit crap. Um, and some of it, I think, is more ambivalent than people think it is. Anyway, so. Uh, this, it's a long poem, so I shouldn't give it a long introduction as well. It does explain why I wrote it right at the start. So this is called Not OK. I saw a poster the other day saying it's OK to be not OK. I was sitting in a waiting room while others sit or just exist on a waiting list for months or years. Growing trauma, worsening fears, not serious enough to jump the queue or get what's good for you. So you stand in line, bide your time, wait your turn. And while you wait, perhaps you'll learn to be more resilient yes that would be brilliant parity of esteem in your dreams the stuff of inspiration memes buzzwords fuzzwords nothing does words set targets trust the market it will decide and it will provide for those who can so is it okay for the poster to say that it's okay to be not okay because i have something else to say that it's not okay no it's not okay that so many people are not okay <sighs> He's a cutter, she's a hoarder, diagnosed with some disorder. Shouting in the street, letting yourself go, starving, stuffing highs and lows. Hidden women asking for help, more men than women killing themselves. And why? Because big boys don't cry. Lock your feelings clean away. So is it OK for the poster to say that it's OK to be not OK? Or would it be better put this way, that it's OK to say you're not OK? Because it's not OK. No, it's not OK that so many people are not OK. Pushed and pulled and put in your place, demands and punches in your face. Missed the grave, potential mislaid, going nowhere but a useless job. Moping, lounging, coping, scrounging. You went to war or it came to you, nothing you could do. And the sights you saw tore your core and keep on pounding at your door. Can't get the pictures out of your mind. Can't get a fix for the kicks or the grind, for the knocks or the losses. Can't bear your crosses left on the shelf. And after all that, you're supposed to feel good about yourself. How does that work then? Show us the way. So is it OK for the poster to say that it's OK to be not OK? Yes, I think it may if it helps to get you through the day, but it's not OK. No, it's not OK that so many people are not OK. Maybe a 
mental health condition diagnosed by a clinician is not a surprising acquisition or thing to consider given the position. Maybe understandable, easily expandable, maybe even rational, compassionate reaction to a horrible, intolerable situation, direct or indirect causation, when life feels unbearable, seems irreparable. One in four, it's a bloody miracle it isn't more. Maybe the people who live through this shit and don't go nuts, don't fall to bits, don't tip the table, don't scream as loud as they are able, don't get labelled. Maybe they are the ones who need their heads examined. What do you say? Would it be OK to put up a display saying it's OK to be not OK? Because I have something else to say that it's not OK. No, it's not OK. There's so many people are not OK. Or maybe your world is fine and dandy, bills paid on time and life as sweet as sugar candy, but still the blues, they keep on creeping up on you, always worries, never sleeps, hasn't done for weeks, and every day's the bloody same. Pressure, blame, distress and shame, and it's not a game, and it's not all in your mind, some of it's in the world outside, so stay in bed, that's what the voices in your head said, keep the demons away. So is it okay for the poster to say that it's okay to be not okay? Yes, I think it may if it helps to get you through the day, but it's not OK. No, it's not OK. There's so many people are not OK. Awareness raised by awareness days. Laying bare now, we're aware how sick we are. Hurrah. And yes, it can help to share distress to get the pressure off your chest, but the pressure will come back again with consequential mental pain until we click that it's the system that is sick. Beyond the days of awareness, the signal virtue and how much we care less of those who rule us who could not care less if they tried. There's them and us and they are on the other side. It's their system that's broken, not your feet of clay. So it is OK for us to say we want the pressure off today for debt and worry to be taken away, to get support without delay, to have time to play. Because it's not okay. No, it's not okay that so many people are not okay. So um, a couple of young filmmakers based in London made a really, really, brilliant film of that poem and I will put the link in the chat um, when I've finished mouthing off um, and, and I'm, going, I'm going to do one more and I should put some other things in the chat as well like I can link to my shop we can buy my books and stuff and my uh, and to my my socials as the young people call them um, and my website and stuff um, but I'm going to end on this one and this is um, oh, over there on my table I, I've got a ballot paper to vote to go on strike again. Yes. Um, I'm actually involved in two strikes at the moment because I'm a member of both the RMT, working on London Underground, and the NEU uh, because I work as a trade union teacher. Um, so I'm part of a posse called Poets on the Picket Line. That any of you is welcome to join if you like. We do what it says on the tin, we turn up to picket lines, and we do poetry. Sometimes, to the bewilderment of the poets, of the pickets, to be to be quite honest, but they soon get used to it, and they always really like it, and uh, and we do benefit gigs and we raise money for strike funds as well, and uh, yeah, it's great, and and often be, being me and being the trade unionist I am, I, I'm both the picket and the poet, so I entertain myself along with other people on the picket line. Anyway. Whenever I do an appearance on a picket line, I always do this poem. I often do other poems as well, but I always do this poem, okay? Because apparently there are some people out there who think there are only 10 commandments, okay? But people active in the trade union movement know that there are 11. And this is called the 11th commandment. I'd rather go to prison or be given a huge fine or have cosmetic surgery from Dr. Frankenstein, sit through a boring lecture on interior design. Yes, I'd rather do most anything than cross a picket line. I'd rather scratch my itches with a prickly porcupine or spend the night in darkest woods when evil stars align. De-skin my legs with sandpaper and wade through lakes of brine. Yes, I'd rather drown in vats of rats than cross a picket line. 
I'd rather drink a cocktail made of sweat and turpentine or live beneath a spiky hedge in Lower Liechtenstein, lie face down in the middle of an open cast coal mine. Yes, I'd rather eat stale camel's feet than cross a picket line. I'd rather be like Tarzan and go swinging from a vine or jump off that big bridge and then go swimming in the Tyne, bathe naked with piranhas in the Hyde Park serpentine. Yes, I'd rather lose my other other eye than cross a picket line, I'd rather rub a massive turd and try to make it shine. Or roll some poo in superglue and stick it to my spine. Invest my lot in Enron stock and watch it sharp decline. Yes, I'd rather go to hell and back than cross a picket line. I'd rather face the rising storm of 1939. Or have my photo taken standing by a turn right sign. Pretend to have the time of day for Michael Hesseltine. Yes, I'd rather have my nails pulled out than cross a picket line. I'd rather take a solemn pledge to never drink more wine. Or place my genitalia in the mouth of a dead swine. Schmooze my way to number 10, then fuck off and resign. Yes, I'd rather scrape the barrel's arse than cross a picket line. I'd rather turn my bedroom into a Justin Bieber shrine or use an off-peak travel card at 25 past nine. Send Ian Duncan Smith a secret scented valentine, but I'd never, no, not ever, ever cross a picket line. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Marvelous. <laughs> 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 <laughs>